And thank you very much for inviting me today. It's, uh, it's great to be here, good to be part of this summit and to hear uh, some of the detail that's perhaps been missing and the different perspectives uh, that it's very, very useful for us all to hear. Um, but I do come, we come from a public health perspective and that's what I want to talk about. Um, can e-cigarettes be the end game for tobacco? Quite a, probably quite a... Um, provocative uh, thought, and I'm so glad that Rosanna mentioned the goal for a smoke-free generation by 2020, so I think you'll know that most people involved in public health have the goal of uh, smoke-free. And as Ash highlighted in their report, I'm sure you talked about this morning, smoking still kills. You know, one in five people are still smoking here in the UK. And smoking still remains the major cause of avoidable uh, illness and death in the UK. So that's why those of us in the public health arena care very much about harm reduction, which is what I want to talk about, and uh, what's going to be happening um, for those people who smoke and how we, how we help them. Um, just to say a, a, a little bit about the Royal Society for Public Health, we're an independent organisation. We've got a long history. Anything with royal in front of it usually has a fairly long history. So we were around in the times of uh, John Snow and cholera, and we actually inhabit John Snow House in the city of London. So, um, so we have a history, but we try and keep up to date with everything, as you'll hear. And I think that uh, it's probably important to know that we're a very multidisciplinary organisation. So we cover uh, everybody from the consultants in public health, we're a membership organisation, we have pest controllers, people who run swimming pools, all sorts of things, because improving and protecting the public's health uh, requires a very large number of people indeed to be involved. As we often say, public health is everybody's uh, business. We do loads of education and training, and over 70,000 people take our qualifications each year in things like food safety and pest control and behavior change and mental well-being. So um, we have two international journals, and so our messages do get out uh, to a fairly, fairly wide audience under our big vision that everyone has the opportunity to optimize their health and well-being. Um, here we are heading, as most of you know, to the Comprehensive Spending Review in a couple of weeks. Um, and it's important to remind ourselves, I think, uh, why... Oh, that's probably the wrong one. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, I've missed one out for you. But I have a slide on the costs of... Um, the costs of unhealthy lifestyles, of which smoking is 5.2 billion annual cost. And, and we think that the government should be investing in prevention... Uh, and I think that's something, if you look at the uh, avoidable illness that we're dealing with, the 14 billion total cost per year, we should be investing in prevention. So the availability of um, e-cigarettes, along with nicotine replacement th therapy, has really provided us with an alternative source of nicotine for smokers. And over this summer... I uh, want to talk about is the policy paper uh, that we published on uh, where we set out how e-cigarettes could help in the bid to reduce smoking because they offer that safer alternative. Um, and we looked at, obviously, the main difference between e-cigarettes and cigarettes. What do they have in common? Because there's a lot of conflation going on. Well, actually, the two main things they have in common is that you're puffing on them, so like a normal cigarette, and they contain nicotine. Otherwise, they're actually very different uh, from uh, combustible tobacco. And according to the latest evidence, of which I'm sure you've heard a lot today, but uh, the recent Public Health England evidence review, which showed, I think, very clearly that e-cigarettes are significantly less harmful than combustible tobacco. But there is a problem, um, and that is that the public don't necessarily understand that. And this is something of been great concern to us, uh, and we did a survey which confirmed actually other studies that have been done um, where we asked the public which of the following actually smokers, which of the following ingredients in a cigarette harmful to health? And I think quite shockingly, 
um, along with the tar and arsenic, which I think the name's obvious, that's pretty harmful to health, 87% of people thought nicotine was harmful. And I think what we need to do as a public health community is change those perceptions. Um, cigarette smoke contains over 4,000 chemicals, got over 250 of them known to be really harmful to health, causing all sorts of serious conditions. Um, but of course, uh, not nicotine, as we've heard today. So is fear of nicotine putting off people from taking up e-cigarettes? And if that's the case, how do we persuade them otherwise? Because we're concerned that smokers understand relative harms. So in our policy paper over the summer, what we said was, well, uh, we equated nicotine to coffee. What we wanted to do was have an easy way uh, to, to say to people that actually nicotine is about as harmful as caffeine or your cup of coffee. Now, I'm sure lots of people could argue with me, but we do need to get messages out, I think, around relative harm, and we felt uh, this was a good one to use. And, and we hoped that by doing this, we would help people quite easily understand why there were nicotine uh, therapies available. We also developed the harm reduction ladder, again, to make it easier, our own little I'm sure you've all got one, but this was ours on this, which is, um, you know, there's very clever people who can quit smoking quite easily right at the bottom who don't need any nicotine-containing products. But as been mentioned earlier in this session, we're left with a lot more hardcore smokers now, uh, and they really need some support. We did some research um, also that showed us that two-thirds of smokers wanted to give up tobacco. They really wanted to give up smoking. So um, we need to help them to do that through nicotine replacement therapies, lozenges, patches, and e-cigarettes. And right up on that red harm, we do not want them uh, to, be, to be smoking. So that's what our paper looked like. And um, as you see, we garnered quite a, a bit of headlines around that. Um, and what we wanted to say on top of the, uh, to smokers, nicotine is significantly less harmful than smoking. We wanted to push the envelope a bit and build on um, the denormalization of smoking, really. Um, to make smoking less convenient and increase accessibility to safer forms of NRT. That was one of the goals of the paper. So we know that in the year following the ban uh, on enclosed space, smoking in enclosed spaces, around 400,000 people gave up because it was just much less convenient uh, to light up and consequently much more effort was made in quitting. So we thought that now might be the right time to push the envelope a bit and say, well, let's have a look um, on further restrictions of places where you can smoke, building on the ban and the uh, recent ban on smoking in cars for those under 18. Uh, and again, at the heart of this was about denormalized smoking. So we suggested banning uh, in smoking exclusion zones around pubs, bars, parks, and school gates. Um, we're following the approach from many other countries, as you probably know, which have proved to be quite successful. So we looked at Hong Kong, which has um, its ban in outside areas in parks and beaches resulted in a 7% uh, reduction in smoking. New York City, which bans smoking outside bars, uh, restaurants, cafes, and in Central Park, resulted in a 22% decline in 10 years. And Lord Darcy, last year, in the London Health Commission report, um, he recommended that we extend that smoking exclusion ban to parks. And in Bristol this year, we now have a 61% approval rating on their exclusion zones uh, for smoking around the city centre. So. Um, the, the, uh, it's not a new suggestion, but the idea was to garner debate and uh, to get a bit of uh, a dialogue around this. In fact, one of my greatest successes, I have to tell you this, was that Nigel Farage stated in the Daily Mirror that if such a ban went through, he would never go to a pub again. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the... Um, 
public place. I'd all like, also like to say I'd love to see it outside hospitals as well because I think um, many of us feel that hospitals should be you know, a real exemplar and that we should not have smoking outside the front of our hospitals. So, safer forms of nicotine need to be more easily accessible, another policy recommendation we made. Um, cigarettes remain the most easy available form of nicotine. Um, and we think we need to redress this balance. So, on a survey of 134 tobacco retailers in London and uh, Newcastle, we found that just three out of 134 stocked NRT products. So if you're nicotine dependent, you pop out in the morning, you go to your local shop, of course you're going to buy the cigarettes because you are not being offered any other choices. Um, so we think that the safer nicotine products should be much more widely available and, and advertised in stores that they are available. And we actually called um, for the mandatory sale of non-tobacco nicotine products in all outlets that are actually uh, selling tobacco products. The other thing we recommended was, uh, which I think you've probably covered a little bit today, but the greater utilization of e-cigarettes by smoking cessation services. So you'll have heard that Leicester was the first uh, cigarette-friendly uh, service, and I know you've heard from uh, Jim McManus this morning from Hertfordshire. Um, others have followed suit, so it's really great to see there's been some progress made in this, but it's by no means universal. And Given the popularity of e-cigarettes as a quitting tool um, and, and evidence uh, and the growing evidence, we think that we really should be seeing um, all of our services offering um, the option and the support around e-cigarettes uh, too. The other thing we recommended was that uh, licensing all outlets that sell tobacco um, as you know, we have, a very, we have the negative licensing here in England, so you, know, you can't sell tobacco to people under 18, but having a negative system means that nothing much positive happens, and we have 207,000 children every year between the ages of 11 to 15 taking up smoking. So if we had a positive licensing, then local authorities would be able to check that uh, retailers were complying and that I think would be a much more robust uh, system. So um, that's what uh, we would hope for. So a final point to end on. I actually had to ask myself, is that really a word? Denicotinization? I'm not sure, but so just take it as something, some loveliness from the Royal Society of Public Health that you heard here today. But we... Um, We've asked ourselves uh, the question, is uh, denicotization an option at all um, if smokers were still free to smoke but without the addictive substance driving behaviour, would, what would that really mean? Um, and I think genuinely uh, concerns, and I think people have talked about reducing nicotine levels in cigar cigarettes, but the concerns are that this would lead to people smoking harder for the nicotine and all more frequently to compensate to get the same amount uh, uh, of the addiction. Um, so what if it was m removed altogether? And um, we haven't talked about this before, but over the summer we did a mini experiment and I don't want any of you academics in the audience looking at me and saying this is, it's not a research, it's not study, it's nothing, anything like that, but it was a bit of an experiment just to, to find, um, just to find out some things. So what we did was we took um, a couple of groups of smokers and divided them into two. We had six in each group. Um, one group were given nicotine-free cigarettes. They do exist uh, in Spain, called Magic, um, as well as e-cigarettes and NRT. And the other group had their regular cigarettes, e-cigarettes and NRT. NRT, and we asked them just to log their use over a period of three days. And though, and though a really small sample size, the, the results were quite interesting, as you can see. So the group who had ordinary cigarettes just kept smoking as normal, and um, no discernible uh, increase in their use of e-cigarettes or NRT. But the group given nicotine-free uh, cigarettes reduced their cigarette use by over 8%, I guess because they weren't getting the nicotine, and then um, they, 
they had a significant increase in their e-cigarette and their NRT uh, usage. So, uh, absolute tiny sample, but, um, you know, is, is that a glimpse to the future? There have been some policy suggestions for endgame strategies, and they've been things like making it illegal to sell tobacco to somebody after the age of 21 or before 21, and that you have a cut-off year. Um, how realistic are any of these things? An outright ban? unrealistic, but I think we do need to look at some of the uh, suggestions that we're having and, and have a debate about some of these areas. Thank you, Thank you very much.